Well, good evening, Temple Baptist Church. It's good to see you. I uh, hope you're having a great week. Hope you are in enjoyed our series that we're doing in the book of Revelation about the seven churches. That's been good to study for. Man, I'm really excited about this week's uh, message. I already began to do some prep work for that. And uh, man, it's really been uh, just great to dig into that. So I'm uh, excited already about Sunday. Tonight's study, we're still in the book of James. We're going to be in chapter 4, uh, and we're going to be picking up in verse 7. Now, remember the context of what we're studying in James' study here is he's, we're, he's explaining to us about the problems of quarrels and conflicts. And, man, he's, he's shown us already the root of those uh, conflicts and those quarrels are, are within us. Uh, our desires, that's where it all begins. Uh, and he's going to take us a little further. We're going to have just two points tonight as we look at verses 7 through 10 of chapter 4. We're going to look at, first of all, the solution that's supplied from God. And then we're going to look at the solution that's applied to man. So those things are going to be important for us moving forward. So let's just read together, beginning in verses 7 through 10, as we see the solution that's supplied from God. He says, Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Then he says, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, he says, and he will exalt you. You know, the solution <clears throat> that James gives to the quarrels and conflicts in our in our life in, in this section are given in the forms of almost like ten commands uh, they 're given in just rapid fire succession there's there 's ten imperatives and it 's almost like there 's this drill sergeant that 's just uh, uh, shouting these out to you just rapid fire submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, draw near to God, cleanse your hands, purify your heart, be miserable, mourn, weep. Let your laughter be turned in the morning and your joy to gloom. And, and the last one, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. And each of these commands, uh, it's important to notice this, each of these commands are given in the aorist tense. Uh, when, when the aorist tense is used with a command, it indicates that there's something that needs to begin immediately. In other words, James is saying, I want you to start doing these things. Uh, they're, they're called to move away from the double-mindedness that he talked about prior uh, the, the, back in chapter 1, and, and he's calling us to return to the Lord, and, and, and they are a call for repentance. You know, the solution to the problem that James presented uh, in, in these six verses uh, of, the, of the chapter here, and, and so just think about the problem, verses 1 through 6, quarrels and conflict, the solution, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, draw near to God. The problem, as described in verses 1 through 6, spiritual murder, cleanse your hands, in verse 8. The problems in prayer, in verse 3, he, in verse 8, he said, purify your heart. Uh, the spiritual adultery, in verses 4 through 5, be miserable, mourn, and weep, the solution. God is opposed to the proud, in verse 6, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, in verse 10. So you see how the problem is revealed in verses 1 through 6. The solution is given to each one of those problems in verses 7 through 10. And, and repentance is that answer. You know, repentance isn't a very popular word nowadays. It, it's not something that we want to hear a lot about. It's not something we want to even talk a lot about uh, in, in our culture. <clears throat> We would rather, uh, you know, hold on to our digni dignity. We would rather hold on to our pride than approach God uh, as, as, as being under his authority. And that's going to be a big issue. Uh, let's look at each one of these commands. First of all, he says, submit, therefore, to God. Submission, as we just talked about authority, submission speaks of recognizing that we are under the authority of God. You know, we're already under the authority of God, whether we recognize it or not. We, and we're called here to submit ourselves willingly to that authority. And that, that's what a Christian is. He's one who recognized the Lord Jesus Christ and has accepted him as his master. We have surrendered ourselves to his authority. And here's the, here's the issue. You'll find that you always submit to something. The opposite of submitting to God is not freedom. 
It's merely submission to another master. In fact, if you're not submitting to God, then James would say that you're submitting to the evil one. You're submitting to Satan. That, that brings to the next point in verse 7. Resist the devil, he says, and he'll flee from you. So how do you resist the devil? You resist the devil by submitting to God. We resist the devil by letting go of our pride, by taking this sort of spirit of humility. When, when you're proud, you're sort of following in Satan's footsteps. He's the, he's the prince of pride. You, you hear a lot of people claiming this verse that if you resist the devil, he's going to flee from you. But that only takes place as you've made the first part of that verse operational. It only takes place as you have submitted to God. Uh, so and if we want the devil to flee from us, we have to make sure that we have submitted ourselves to God. I, uh, the best illustration of this is the Disney movie Lion King. There's a scene in that movie uh, where the lion cub has been threatened by these large hyena, and they're going to eat him for lunch. And he makes this little bitty baby cub growl, and they just laugh at him, and they continue to come forward. But then suddenly they stop. And their eyes just uh, grow wide and they just sort of begin to cower down and, 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 and make their way away from this cub. And the question is, what, what changed? They realized that the father was standing behind the cub. He's big, he's strong, and he's not to be messed with. And so our resistance to the devil is, is like that. It's the Lord Jesus who has defeated Satan. He defeated Satan when he went to the cross. He died for our sins and then he rose again. He conquered death uh, and, and he arose from the dead with this roar like a, like a lion. So Satan is, de is the, a defeated enemy, but he's only defeated uh, when you're the, with the one who is his conqueror. So he is only defeated as we are surrendered to Christ in our life. That's important for us to remember. So those first two, he says, submit to God. And as you submit to God, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. And then third, draw near to God, he says, and he'll draw near to you. And I want you to notice something here. The Christian life is not static. The Christian life is always moving. Either you're moving toward God or you're moving away from God. You know, you remember the story of the prodigal son who'd taken his inheritance. He'd left his home and he'd, he'd moved away from his father. He moved out into the world and he lost it all. And then in his sorrow and his lost condition, he decides to, to move back home, to come home and throw himself at the father's mercy. And he had everything planned out, how he would come, how he'd knock on the father's door, how he would plead for his position as a servant. But you know what happened? While he was a long way off, the father saw him ran to him and meet him. And that's exactly what the Lord does. When you draw near to him, uh, he, he will draw near to you. You know, it's been said that if you aren't close to God, uh, and you're not as close to God as you used to be, it wasn't him who moved. It's us that has moved away. And, and yet, as you come back to God, uh, he will draw back near to us. That's important for us to understand. So he says, thirdly, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Fourth, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, in verse 8. And here we have this cleansing and, and purifying. They were, they were very familiar themes uh, to who would be the recipients of this letter. Uh, this, this letter was written to the Jews, the 12 tribes that were scattered abroad. And their religious background was just filled with re ritual cleansing, purifying, but, but what James is talking about here is just more than just ritualism. It's both an, an inward and an outward aspect of this command. The outward action, he says, cleanse your hand. The inward action, he says, purify your hearts. The, the outward actions, you sinners, the inward attitude is, is you double-minded. So we see the outward action and we see it an inward attitude. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. You sinners, that's the outward action. The inward attitude is you double-minded. So sinners focus on the outward sins that are committed. Uh, that that, that double-minded there talks about that, that attitude toward the world that's been mentioned already. Then look at number five in verse nine. Be miserable, mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned in the morning and your joy to gloom. And here we have this. This is the language also of Repentance. You know, probably when we were younger, you might have heard repentance being taught as something that wasn't emotional at all. Repentance, uh, we've been taught in the past, is not an emotional thing. 
it, 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 it was presented as if it was more of a mental thing. But I want you to notice that the biblical repentance contains both mental as well as emotional. It's a brokenness for our sin. In fact, Jesus said those that mourn are blessed. And it's not just mourning over the hardships of life. It, it's mourning. Uh, it's not just mourning over a bad day. It's mourning over our spiritual condition. And it, it's seeing the spiritual shape that we're in, the spiritual state that we're in, and seeing it as God sees it, and then just being broken and mournful over that. So this repentance does carry with it, does include not just the mental, but includes the emotional, being emotionally uh, just broken over our sinfulness. Then the sixth imperative here, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Uh, this command here is given in the passive voice. And instead of humbling yourself, and instead of humbling yourself, you are to be humbled. So how can you be humbled? You do it by seeing yourself as you already are and seeing yourselves as God really sees you and realizing there's no comparison between you and God. You know, the world tells us to promote ourselves or to toot our own horn because nobody else is going to toot our horn for us. But Scripture tells us not to toot our own horn, and the, and the Lord does that for us. So there we, we see that solution that's supplied from God. And he just ran through these, these, these uh, commands that he gives us almost like a, a list of Ten Commandments. He does it very much in a, in a drill sergeant way as he lays each one of those out. Now, the second part of these verses, we, we see that the solution is applied to men. Let's look at verse 11. It says, Do not speak against one another, brethren, but he who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks what? Against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, and the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you that you should judge your neighbor? <clears throat> Remember, up to this point, we've been speaking about the problem of quarrels and conflicts and the solution to that problem. But here's the great thing about James. He doesn't leave it in some uh, theory. He brings it into the practical aspect of life. He applies it to, to where we are. He applies it to the problems that they were experiencing uh, with, within, within the church, within their group of people. And, and we need to do the same. So if you look at it, you see in, in, in verse 7 through 10, you, we look at the believer's relationship with God. Then verses 11 through 12, we look at the believer's relationship with other men. And, and verses 7 through 10, as we mentioned, those imperatives were given in the aorist tense, and the, and the words here are given in the present tense, and that makes a difference. So let's look at verse 11. Do not speak against one another, brethren. Now, as we said, in verses 7 through 10, we have the aorist tense that forces us to do something. Now there's a change. Now it's in the present tense. And, and to make it even more different, it's the present tense, but it has a negative command. So in the Greek language, where the negative command is given in the present tense, it carries some, some weight with it. It carries force with it. In other words, you can hear James saying, stop it. Stop doing this. And when he says, stop speaking against one another, he's indicating that they had been speaking this way previously uh, and, and against one another, and they've been guilty of this activity. So, so we're not speaking against one another, but rather we're to use our words in building up one another is what James is trying to say. Then look at verse 11. He who speaks against a brother uh, uh, or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. Now notice the flow of this, of this argument. A person who speaks against his brother is not showing the kind of love that's demanded by the law. And therefore, he's setting himself up, making himself to be a judge of that law. And if you try to judge the law, you are, in effect, s s trying to do something that only God can do. Uh, for he's the lawgiver and the judge, and, and you're taking a lot of uh, prerogative upon yourself to, to, to be able to put yourself in that situation where you set yourself up as judge. You know, it's one thing to set yourself up against another person, but it's another thing to set yourself up against uh, the one who holds eternity in his hands. 
So let, let's look at verse 12. But who are you, he says, to judge your neighbor? You know, God is able to judge your neighbor. He, for, he is the judge. He's the lawgiver. But you are not God, and I'm not God, and we don't have that prerogative. I, I love the, the illustration. Jesus told the story of a man who was in debt to this king, and he, and he worked, and he saved, and he tried to pay off his debt, but it was just no use. It was just one of those impossible debts. The more he tried, the deeper he fell, and finally, he's forced to sell himself into slavery. And as a slave, he came before the king to stand trial for his delinquent debt. Uh, and in a show of just tremendous grace, the king completely forgave him of his debt. And, and he went on to purchase him even out of slavery, and he set him free. And, and as you can imagine, when this man was set free, he was just speechless. And he, he pledged his devotion to the king. And after thanking him, he started home. And then when he's on the way home... Uh, this freed man happened upon another one of the king's slaves who actually owed him a, a few dollars, and he demanded that he be paid at once. And when the slave explained that he had no money and, 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 he, and, and he didn't wasn't able to pay the debt, the former slave, you remember the story, the former slave became angry and, and actually beat the man. And news traveled, and it reached the palace, and, and the king called for the man who had been freed, and he came in uh, before the throne, and the, and, the, and the king called for another accounting. And in Matthew 18, 32, 33, it says, Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you entreated me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave, even as I had mercy on you? And the man was just speechless before the king. And you know what? And when we set ourselves up to try to judge our brothers or, or judge the situation uh, uh, that our brothers are in, and we, we use our words to make those judgments, you and I are doing the same thing. And guess what? There's going to be a time when we're going to find ourselves uh, absolutely speechless as we are asked to give an account for that. Man, this, this is just an amazing passage to think about. So as we, as we wrap up our time tonight, he, he shared with us in verses 7 through 10 the solution uh, for our conflicts and our quarrels, and he just laid out these commandments for us to stop, to stop doing. Uh, and, and then he gives the solution that's applied to us toward man, how we are to begin to relate to one another. So, man, I love this book. I love that it's so practical. And the application is just so easy to transfer into our lives. So let's just be mindful of those things that 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 Christ has, uh, through James, has just encouraged us to do. You know, submit ourselves to God. Resist the devil. Draw near to God. Cleanse our hands. Purify our hearts. Be broken over our sinful condition. And allow his grace uh, to just flow into our lives. Man, I sure hope this has been helpful for you. Uh, I'd encourage you to go back and read this chapter, uh, the, these these verses in their entirety. They just flow together so well. They're just such great teaching points, uh, and, and and I hope it's been beneficial uh, to you. Uh, let me close this in prayer, and uh, uh, and we will end our time tonight. Father, which is a blessing to be under the authority of your word, and Father, may we seek to just uh, submit ourselves to your authority, Father, each and every day. Lord, and a part of submitting ourselves to your authority, Lord, is, is submitting ourselves to the authority of your word. And Lord, you've encouraged us. Lord, you've, you've, you've pleaded with us through James in this letter, Lord, uh, to just uh, how to handle our conflict and the quarrels that are in our life. So Lord, uh, may we place ourselves under the authority of this scripture. And Lord, may we be graceful uh, to those that we encounter and that we relate to. Father, once again, we do pray for Temple Baptist. We pray for the search committee. Uh, Lord, as they're doing their work, we just pray for their uh, leadership, that you would lead them, guide them. Lord, give them clarity. Lord, give them discernment. Lord, as you prepare even now, uh, the next pastor for Temple Baptist Church. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you, church. Look forward to seeing you Sunday, whether you'll be joining online, whether you'll be joining in person. It's going to be a great, great day to worship uh, and uh, hear from God's Word. Uh, God bless, and we'll see you Sunday.